It is now my pleasure to turn today's program over to Mr. Glenn Butterfield, Contractor Specialist. Sir, please go ahead. Hey, thanks everyone for, for showing up uh, on this Friday morning, taking a break from your quarantine to go over some, some installation and, and product information. Uh, I appreciate you coming out. So this, this is going to be a high-level installation and product overview. We're going to cover um, some of the, the molded product, and then we're going to go on to talk about uh, some of the breezewood, uh, and then we're going to cover some wrapping uh, tips and, and highlights uh, for the for the privacy style extreme defenses. Um, I know that the the introduction or the title says ATP. Um, this is not an ATP, but this is uh, maybe a sampler is a good word for what uh, some of the information that the ATP covers. So hopefully, uh, as you as you listen in, um, you'll learn a thing or two, and and if you do. Uh, then, you know, maybe maybe you'll get a taste of, of what the ATP has to offer. So uh, first thing that we're going to talk about is some of the, the Bucktech molded fence. Um, and before we talk about uh, the insulation stuff, <clears throat> I think it's important to understand why you're, you're selling it or why your customers uh, are, should be interested in, in having this installed at their, at, at their residences, businesses, Etc. So of course you got your choice of textures and colors, um, and you've got a low maintenance. Uh, you know, some people would say a virtually uh, maintenance-free uh, fence. We like to make sure that people understand because if someone uses a hose, I suppose, uh, to wash it off, uh, that could be considered maintenance. So it is extremely low maintenance, um, virtually maintenance-free. It's easy to assemble. Um, I have people ask me sometimes, is it easy to install? And I kind of chuckle because I think those are two different uh, – I don't know if they're asking the question they think they're asking because uh, fence is only to, is easy to install as it is to clear out the brush, uh, you know, dig the holes, work your way around the rocks, et cetera, et cetera. So is it easy to install? Eh, probably not. But is it, is it easy to assemble once you've got all your, your measurements and your hole digging done? Uh, I think it is, and I think that especially fencing professionals who understand the ins and outs of of working in the soil and working with the tools um, can get very, very quick and very adept with this product. Uh, it's extremely durable. Um, we're working with a polyethylene material, which has a, a lot of um, tensile strength, so it will take quite a bit of impact without cracking, even in cold weather, um, which makes it ideal for uh, commercial uses as well as backyards. You know, if you've got active kids that are playing sports and throwing balls and kicking balls, et cetera, around the yard, um, especially if you're, if you're talking baseball, softball, those types of things, um, this is an offense that's going to take all of that without having to, to um, do a lot of uh, repairs. Uh, you've got solid privacy, both visual and sound, because this the uh, molded fence does have some sound uh, deadening properties, um, and it's it's wind rated for Miami-Dade County, uh, which is nice when it comes um, straight out of the box, ready to ready to take those high winds. Um, and it's it's got an excellent warranty and graffiti resistance. I think the graffiti resistance is a big selling point for uh, HOAs and for municipalities, uh, as well as uh, kind of the, the business owners uh, and things like that. Um, just to give you an idea of the graffiti resistance, so this is an actual picture of graffiti that had been sprayed onto one of our fences around an HOA after it had been put up. And after it was washed, there you go. And, and that's a power washer. And so you can even see if you look down at the kind of concrete area, the, the, the paint is still in kind of that porous structure of the concrete, but it's been washed clear of the polyethylene uh, molded fence. And so when you're working with businesses or with municipalities, states, et cetera, and they're talking about long-term uh, you know, sound abatement or uh, fence solutions, and they and they maybe do have graffiti in the area. 
Uh, I think this is a really great option to try and sell them into that um, that will help them over the over the long term. So we're going to talk about some data installation. We're going to talk about two things primarily uh, as we get into this uh, product. We're going to we're going to talk about uh, data installation, and then we're going to talk about stepping. Uh, Hopefully, uh, people on this call have a little bit of an understanding of how this product goes together um, because it's not going to be comprehensive. If you feel like there's any gaps, um, you know, get with your territory manager. They'll get with me, and we can, we can schedule something. We can help you all out to get a better understanding of the, the finer points of putting this in across the board. But this is going to be pretty high, uh, high level on the installation aspect other than we're going to focus on gates and we're going to focus on the stepping. So with the gate installation, you're going to set the gate opening. I like to focus when you're installing this product specifically, uh, starting at the gate, starting with the gate post. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. Number one, the gates for this product are fixed. They're a fixed size. You're not going to do a field modification. You're not going to do a custom order size. And so if you set that uh, gate opening, that way you can, you can build the fence around the gate rather than building the fence, getting to the end and realizing, uh-oh, our gate is going to have a struggle fit or we're going to have to um, you know, tear something out, etc. The other reason that I like to start with the gate is because you want those posts set in the concrete as early as possible because that's going to allow um, the concrete some time to cure. Uh, so having that having that concrete uh, cure and then and then actually hanging the gate. So set your spacing first, but hang the gate kind of at the end of the day, and that way your your concrete has a little bit more time to cure. Um, so let's look let's let's look at this uh, gate insulation. Hopefully you've had time to kind of read a little bit that of that while I've been talking. Um, in the installation, we've got kind of this matrix for for how to set up a gate. Uh, opening. And so if you're doing a single opening for a three, four, five, six foot wide, you have this chart that shows you. And then if you go over, you can see a double when it's paired with different sizes. And this gives you the inside to inside opening. Um, this is a convenient matrix, but it's not something you're probably going to be, be memorizing. Um, what, I, what I like to do is just memorize Uh, is just to memorize the uh, spacing, right? So you've got an inch and a half on your hinge side. And you've got an inch on your latch side. And that's uh, going to be the same no matter what the opening is, uh, or no, no matter what the gate setup is. So if you've got a double uh, gate, then you've got an inch on each, or I'm sorry, an inch and a half on each hinge side, and then an inch on the latch side in between. And so you'll have a total of four inches that you add to the nominal size of your gate. And I say the nominal size, the, the, other, the other thing as I'm talking about an inch and an inch and a half for your measurements is go off the nominal measurement of your gate not necessarily pulling a tape because one of the things that you will come to know as you work more and more with this product is you will come to understand that polyethylene expands and contracts uh, to a pretty high degree. Um, if you're used to working with vinyl, it's going to be much, much greater than what you're used to seeing out of vinyl. And so uh, the four-foot gate, consider that it is a 48-inch gate, even if you're installing in February and you take a measurement and it's actually a 40, you know, 47, 47 and a quarter, whatever the case may be, or if you're installing in July and it's a 48 and a half, if, if, you, if you follow me. So yeah, so take the nominal measurement of your gate, add an inch and a half for the hinge and an inch for the latch. The first thing you're going to do when you're installing any gate, uh, of course, after, uh, I should say when hanging your gate, when installing the gate, you put your posts in as mentioned, but when you're, uh, hanging the gate, the first thing you want to do is you want to get the striker on. Uh, I know that's a little bit different probably than what you've done on other gates. However, 
uh, it's going to make a big difference on this because what you have for the, for the gates is you actually have an internal frame and the shell on these polyethylene gates is kind of floating on top uh, of, those, uh, of that frame. So the, the shell can actually move quite a bit. So if you get the latch, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the striker, or in the case of a double gate, the striker on one side, the latch on the other, um, if you get that attached first, that makes sure that these button head screws that you see pictured um, are able to reach. Then you're going to put the hinges on. So once you've attached the, the striker and or latch, if you're doing a double, you're going to put your hinges in. And these hinges uh, thread straight into that frame. And you can see the long bolt, uh, you know, and, and ample threading. So even if that's sucked over to the, to the side by the latch, which it will be, um, particularly if you're, you're installing um, in the heat of summer, you know, July, July August, then that's going to give you enough that you can reach over, get that threaded in. Um, next, you're going to set your height. So you, you want to determine your desired height and, and set your posts, obviously, accordingly um, if you've got ground slope, et cetera. But, but once again, make sure your concrete has time to set up. These gates are heavy. Uh, they are an internal steel frame. And so they will be exerting a, a fair amount of, of force on there. So, so make sure that whatever you do, you're giving your concrete some time to set up. Uh, also, having two people when you hang these gates is, is advisable to help you get them, get them steady and leveled. And speaking of leveling, cutting some blocks, especially if you have a relatively level ground, um, cutting blocks that you can rest the gate on is going to help relieve weight uh, while you – while you hang these on the post and, and get the hinges screwed into the into the post. And then once you've got the that gate hung, um, you know, remove your blocks, let it let it settle into that. And then I actually just take the latch itself, connect it to the striker, and let that gate swing in, and that's going to give you your height of where you want that latch connected to your post, pin it in place move the gate out of the way, and then uh, make sure that you uh, throw in those self-tapping screws to get your latch uh, connected with your, with your post. Then you're going to do your self-tightening. So this, what, what's pictured, that's actually going to be on, uh, most likely on the bottom. You'll be able to get in there with your, um, and I guess it depends on how you hang the gate. Usually it's on the bottom when I do it. And that, that, that'll, be, that'll allow you to uh, twist, set your tension, and use that movable pin in order to uh, move around that and get it, get it tensioned. You want to be careful when you do this because you can, you can put a lot of uh, pressure on that if you crank too hard. You don't want to snap your spring. You don't want to over-tighten. And uh, if you have any questions about, about any of the gate stuff, uh, feel free to type those in. Um, we're monitoring that, and we will get to those uh, as, 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 uh, when we can. Um, so stepping in molded fence, let's, uh, look at the, let's look at the stepping, how you step and how you navigate a hill. Obviously, with a single panel system like this, uh, racking isn't going to be an option. So you've got a, a couple of options. Um, you can set your stair stepping to where you're going at ground level from the uphill post uh, and then going down to the, to the downhill post uh, into the uphill side and leaving a gap. That works really well for, for minor slopes, uh, depending on the situation. Uh, certainly we all, you know, we've, all of us who have worked in the fence business know that dogs and animals are tend to be a great concern for a lot of people and so in that case you want to try and minimize uh, that gap between the fence and the ground and so hey Glenn yeah real quick going back to the gate is there an issue with that hinge coming loose over time when it's screwed into the frame and is there anything that you have to do to compensate for that um, yeah, so, so it was on, I, I, thank you, Doug, because there was, there was a, a little 
blip on one of the slides, there, there are those adjusting bolts. So as you screw those, um, those hinges in, um, that adjusting bolt can be tightened up. And so if there, if there is a little uh, sag or if it, if it uh, leans a little over time, you can adjust that with the adjusting bolts. Um, hopefully there isn't, but if there is, you can, you can use those adjusting bolts to kind of pull that level a little bit. Does that, does that clarify for on that? Okay. All right. So continuing with the stair stepping, the other uh, maybe benefit to polyethylene is that it's non-reactive. This is one of the reasons why it works so well to clean the graffiti off and things don't stick to it is because it doesn't react with with things really. And so acidic soils, uh, basic soils, whatever, they're not going to corrode or damage the product. And so if you want to eliminate some of that gapping at the bottom, you can trench and actually bury part of the uphill side of the panel. Um, you know, in the image, it's a little extreme. I, maybe you want to bury the whole thing. We, we actually had um, customers that were worried about uh, animals getting in and out and so they did they they, they buried the entire bottom of, of their their whole fence and that's fine the thing you want to be careful about though when you are doing this kind of an installation is you want to make sure that your soil on both sides of the fence is pretty equal because if you're it, um, with the polyethylene having a lot of tensile strength it's also quite flexible and so what you'll get if you pack a lot of soil on one side and not on the other, is you'll get bulge where that soil is pushing and, and making your, your fence bulge. So you, wanna, you want to make sure that you're burying uh, equally and also uh, compacting equally. So if you're compacting the soil in, you wanna make sure and do that kind of concurrently on both sides so that you're not pushing one side of the fence way out. So, Let's talk about uh, talk about going downhill. The easiest way for me. So there's a couple of ways that that I that I've done this going down the hill. One is if you are concerned with kind of a consistent step. If 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 consistency in your stepping uh, is your goal, then you may want to just set your side string and set a top string over. So so set your top post and your bottom post. And then you can run your, run your side string, but you can also run a string across the top of your top post and your bottom ho post of the slope. And then as you're installing the posts, you can just match that post to that string that goes over the top of the two posts. The, the benefit of this is you're going to get a steady, even step. The downside of it is you're going to have to negotiate whatever that bottom uh, feeds you and so you're probably going to have to do more of the trenching and burying and soil work to make sure you're keeping that even on both sides um, the probably quicker way and more common way for me is to simply start up top and work your way downhill by uh, first getting your uh, kind of um, template I guess you could say uh, what I do is I get an eight foot long two by four, cut it to 74 inches, and then take that cut piece that you've just cut off of the eight foot and turn it on a T and you throw some screws in there and now you've got a T jig. Uh, and that T jig can slide down and now you just pop your bracket at 74 inches. If you're on flat ground, you can do this on both sides before you ever put the posts up, uh, save your back and save your knees from having to bend down and get those uh, brackets screwed in. Um, but when you're working down a hill, you do this for your first post, and then you do it for every uphill bracket on, on each post, because that uphill bracket will always be at that 74, uh, if that makes sense. And, and so what you can do is once you get that uphill bracket set, um, you negotiate the downhill side, and then you can use a level. Pull out one of your steel stiffeners from your panel. Each panel has steel in the top and the bottom. So pull out one of those, and you can use your level. If your level has a magnetic strip on it, all the better. Uh, and you can use that uh, steel stiffener to level between the downhill side of the post and that 74-inch bracket that you've set on the uphill side of your post. Once that post is set in place, 
now you can go and you can set your downhill side bracket at grade level and continue this all the way down the hill. Um, this is, is likely not going to give you an even step, but it will help you follow the ground uh, as closely as possible without, without you know, a lot of trenching or digging. Um, so it depends on what you need and it depends on the grade, uh, et cetera. So. So if you have any questions about that downhill stepping, uh, or if I if I fail to uh, to explain it sufficiently, uh, type those in. We can always jump back like we just did with the gates. Um, otherwise, let's move on to a little bit of the extruded and the breeze wood and some of the installation uh, tips with this. All right, so. First, as with, the, as with the molded, I want to talk about some key selling features um, with our, with our Serta grain uh, products. You've got the realistic wood grain texture. You've, again, got choices of colors. And, and really this choice of colors, I think, is becoming more and more important uh, to homeowners as we move into our backyard as a living space. You'll often hear outdoor living space used now. Um, you know, we see tens of thousands of dollars being thrown into built-in grills and ovens, um, hardscape, et cetera. And uh, the mentality and the focus on backyards uh, is really shifting to that of an outdoor living space. And just like your indoor living space, uh, you know, all the walls in my house aren't just painted white. Um, they're not just flat. You know, they have pictures. We have decorations. And it's because it sets a nice uh, background for our living space when we have friends over company uh, or just our everyday lives. And the same thing is true for the backyard. When you're talking with your customers uh, and helping them evaluate what their needs are in their backyard, uh, this isn't just a backyard where, where they're throwing their, their you know, <laughs> their kids to get them out of their hair during the uh, COVID lockdown or whatever. It's an outdoor living space. It's a part of their life. It's a part of the way that they um, experience every day. And so they might as well uh, make it beautiful and, and make it uh, what, they're, what they're looking for. Um, again, low maintenance, um, solid privacy. You got, uh, we, we do have the wind rated on this. Uh, you will need to kind of consider the, the aluminum inserts. Um, the posts don't, don't come ready to go uh, for the wind rating, um, and then also we have a sound sound rating on our on our Chesterfield, um, not on the on the breezewood that we're about to look at, but when we talk about racking here in a minute, that that Chesterfield it is it is uh, sound rated. So. so let's talk about the breezewood. So the first thing you want to do on a breezewood job is, is to figure your distance. And I know that that sounds pretty basic. Of course, you want to figure your distance. But it, it's a little bit more important on the breezewood because when possible, you want to start with your smallest sections. As, as you can see, um, this first picture, there's only a certain amount of flex that those pickets have in them, particularly uh, in the cold. Obviously, they have a little less flex. And when you get to shorter sections, you're not going to be going to be able to weave those in and out of the mid brace here. Um, so the other thing that you can do is if you start with the smaller sections, um, you can do a push through technique that you see on the second picture. Instead of trying to flex those and trying to bend those, you can do this push through. I actually like doing that as, as much as possible um, when you're putting this up rather than trying to flex them each time. And so really, that leaves you with only the very last uh, section that you'll need to flex those in, unless, of course, the last section of the run is a smaller one, in which case, uh, you know, flex, install the middle, the middle sections or the larger sections and install those smaller sections first because it's going to make your life a little bit easier. Um, the other thing that you can do, especially when you get to a very small section, um, and maybe you are just running a single section in between a home uh, is, or, you know, whatever the case may be, is to actually install everything into the post, and then the last post you can feed down into the hole while you also feed the rails and the pickets into the, into the post. All right. So when you're when you're dealing with these shorter sections, you're going to need to cut the the rails to size. 
it's a little bit more difficult when you have this centered mid brace than it would be on your traditional privacy or something like that because you need the those aesthetics for that to stay dead center and so when you're making these cuts you want to find the center of the rail first and then you take your measurement which is going to be from inside a post to inside of post and add an inch and a quarter, or I'm sorry, an inch and three quarters to each side, um, or you know, three, three, uh, three and a half inches, and and that's going to be how you cut that. You're going to the reason I say inch and a quarter to each side is because really you split that distance in half. So you make the measurement from inside to inside, split that distance in half, and then you add that inch and three quarters measurement, and that's where you're going to measure from the center of that rail to each side before you make your cuts. And then you're also going to have to cut your, your pickets. Now, with the pickets, you don't have to worry about that. You can just cut it, you know, take your total measurement and add your, your, uh, your three and a half inches and make your cut. But when you make that cut, be sure that you're recrimping. And if you'll notice, when I'm crimping, I'm crimping on the top and on the bottom of that picket, not on the sides. And that's actually pretty important if you want to avoid callbacks on this. If you fail to crimp, then you're going to get disengagement. Um, and it's, it's kind of a guarantee. And you know and I know there's nothing worse than a callback. You want to avoid that whenever possible. And so crimp. Uh, every time you cut these pickets. Now, the second part of that, though, is crimping the top and the bottom instead of the sides. The sides are tempting because they're a little easier to get to, especially if you, you know, have a, a larger crimp tool, but there's also more flex in those sides, and so they can be pushed and become disengaged, whereas the top and the bottom um, tend to get a little bit more engagement. And so if you need a smaller, the, the tool that is being used here is, is an SL2 snap lock punch from Malco. Um, so any smaller snap, snap lock punch that you can get in there and get kind of that high round crimp so you get good engagement on the top and the bottom is going to help you uh, avoid callbacks. So if you're just doing a, kind of the end, the end panel, the, the last of the run, or the larger panel, um, as with the other ones, first thing you do is your lock rings on your rails. Then you're going to put in your mid brace, and this is kind of that weaving technique that I was talking about earlier where you flex them, which works great for a full-size panel and really works pretty well uh, for any panel up to about six feet. Um, Probably in warmer weather, you can you could even get away with smaller than that without risk of, of creasing your pickets. But as soon as you get around six feet and smaller, it gets a lot more difficult to do this weaving technique, and you might want to try and focus on the on the push through. Um, but hey, Glenn, we'll one 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 question that came in: When you get down into smaller sections, is there a point where you no longer need that mid brace? Um, there's a point where you no longer need it, yeah, but the, the largest that's going to be uh, is going to be a four-foot section. And so if you're at a four-foot section, you can get away with no mid-brace. Um, and actually, I think it looks better. However, you know, as with all things, um, there's, a, there's a thing I often say, both in selling and in installation, uh, things are only a problem if you don't talk about them. And And so thank you for this question because, I need to talk about it, obviously. Um, when, you're, when you're talking with your customer, make sure they understand that that four-foot section won't have a mid-brace. For most people, I think that's going to be fine. Uh, but for, for, for others, they have an idea that everything should have the mid-brace. Um, it can get looking pretty busy, especially if you have like a small three-foot section and you have a mid-brace as well. Uh, I think it looks busy, but that's an aesthetics call. So I would have the conversation with the homeowner and then, you know, figure that into, into your labor because it's going to be easier to cut that four- or three-foot section without a mid-brace, obviously, than it is going to be to, to make that mid-brace work. That's going to take more time and, and more labor. Um, all right, so flex that, uh, flex that in, and then you just work your way up. You do the whole thing. Throw in your lock rings on your top rail and then you put that in. Great, almost done. 
there is a thing that I will say, and I'll, I, you know, if, if, if yeah, I ever come out to your place and we do a training, I'll say it a lot. Uh, always use your mid rail hardware kit, whether that's a vertical mid rail like we have on the Breezewood, or or it's a horizontal mid rail uh, like you would have on the uh, the Imperial or Princeton or whatever. You really want to to use those mid rail hardware kits because they keep everything uh, looking the way it's it's designed to look. So on this, what you're going to do for the mid rail hardware kit is first you want to make sure that you're leveled out. You check your horizontal, you check your plumb on your mid brace. If everything is where you want it, you want to make sure that your pickets are uh, the right distance as well. So measure the distance on your picket, and what you may see, what you'll probably see, is that toward the center, uh, the there will be just a little sag. So give it a little push up until your measurement's the same, and then you throw in your mid-rail hardware kit, which is a screw, a nylon washer, and this snap cap. As you can see, it's a color match. Uh, snap cap, and that'll keep everything locked in. All right, so uh, let's talk about stepping, because this product is also a product that is stepped. Um, racking isn't, isn't a real option with this. Uh, you may be able to get a degree or two, but a couple of problems with that. One uh, is that mid-rail really binds things up and makes it impossible. The other thing is when people are, are going through a horizontal product, uh, they're really going for a horizontal product, and when you start racking it, you're going to throw off the aesthetics of those nice square horizontal lines. Uh, here we have a really great example of, of a step that keeps those horizontal lines and keeps everything uh, looking those 90-degree angles uh, that uh, give this its, its aesthetic appeal. So let's talk about what that stepping takes. All right, so first things first, routing template, right? Obviously, you don't want to measure and hand route all of this stuff. It is going to take you a ton of time. Luckily, CertainTeed has available uh, these, these routing template kits. Um, talk to your territory managers. Talk to your sales guys. They'll, they'll get you hooked up and, and understand, you know, how you can get these, how you can order them. Um, consider this. There are five sets of clamping holes. Uh, there are three bags of clamping hardware. There's a, you know, it's this big long thing. So you can uh, throw on those wing nuts and the, that clamping hardware on every single post that you do, or uh, you, you know, you might want to make uh, a box like the one you see here. So it's got an internal five by five dimension. Um, one of the things not pictured that you can do is you see the lag bolt there at the base of of the post. Um, if you extend this, uh, this box up by a foot or so, then every inch you can make a hole for this lag bolt, and you can make a quick guide uh, that as you're installing, you say, okay, we've got a three-inch uh, drop on this next one. And so you, you lower the lag bolt three holes, and you push it down, use your bar clamp to clamp it in place, and you route your holes out. And so that can help you really quickly um, set that where you need it to need it to be and make a lot make your job a lot easier. Uh, the other thing to to keep in mind when you're doing these is obviously if you're routing on a stepped product project, you're going to order end posts. That, that's all you're going to order if your entire thing is stepped. All you're going to order is end posts. If we go if we go back um, to that picture we just looked at. You can see that until they hit the flat ground, all of those were factory ends, and then you can field route those to accommodate um, to accommodate that step. So things to remember when racking. If, if you have no other questions on that, if you do, type them in. We can jump back, or I'll give you just a minute before we start talking about racking and, and privacy fence. Okay, cool. Let's uh, let's move right along because we want to want to get through this and and leave 10 or 15 minutes for any questions or, or anything you may need. Um, all right, things to remember when racking. Your rail angle will tell you all things. So this probably doesn't make sense in the context of this slide, but as we go on, just remember just remember that thing. Your rail angle will tell you all things. Um, over 10 degrees will definitely require modification. So if, if you're 
Um, if you have calculated your angle and you know that you're over 10 degrees, just know that you're going to have to do some modification. Um, order the end post, just like the stepping, and, and we'll see why this makes sense later, even with the racking. But you're going to want end posts instead of line posts when you're on a steep grade. Uh, and when the panel racks, it shrinks. Uh, this is important to remember for ordering purposes as well, because if you've taken your measurements, um, if you've got a big long run and uh, and a healthy uh, angle, you may not have enough product when you finish when you get to the end. So having an extra panel and an extra uh, post will save you from having to quit a job in the middle, which you know every time you have to pull off of a job and then go back, that's costing us costing you money and, and we want to avoid that. And then finally, the templates are going to give you a factory finish hole. And honestly, in the end, I think that when you get good with them, uh, they save you some time because to make a good hole, whether you're using, you know, drills and your jigsaw or a roto zip or a Dremel uh, or whatever you're using, making a, a relatively good hole is time consuming. It, it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of patience to, to get that cut right. So. All right, so a couple of ways to find your find the angle of the rail. One is just to lay it down and then scribe your line on the rail and say, okay, this is where we're going to cut it. And that's, that's the rail angle that I was talking about in that first slide, is if you lay that rail down after you've put your posts in and you scribe that line and make that cut, or whether you're using the angle finder and transferring that to your miter saw, that angle – um, at least for that section, if you've got a steady grade, that's going to be the same angle on all of them. If your grade isn't so steady and you're, you're adjusting that quite a bit, uh, that rail angle is still going to be important for, for that section. And we'll see, we'll see why as we go through these. Uh, so first of all, after you've made that cut, now you can just lay this up against the next post and you know how big that that whole opening is going to be because when you cut on an angle it actually lengthens the size that your rail hole is going to need to be to accommodate for it so you'll want to make that mark but you always want to add an eighth of an inch so whether you're taking a measurement of this cut length or whether you're laying the rail up there and and making a line you're going to want to add an eighth of an inch to the size of that, that hole um, the reason you want to do that is because when, you're, when you add that eighth of an inch, that accounts for the wall thickness. So if you cut it the exact size of that hole, when you go to insert the rail um, on the exterior, uh, you know, in this case where you're going downhill, on the exterior of the top and the interior of the bottom, um, that angle is, or the thickness of the post is going to get in the way of that rail. So adding an eighth of an inch is going to accommodate for that. Always open the holes toward the center of the post. This is going to keep the height reference points intact uh, and, and the picket at a workable length. If you open them any way other than toward the center, you're going to, you're going to get holes and panels that are sitting at odd angles in comparison to each other. And so you'll get a similar look to what you get when you are installing a, a line post and seven end post, and we'll, we'll look at what that looks like. So you can use a roto zip, like I said, or you can use one of these templates. You can use your uh, whatever, whatever is comfortable for you. I really like the templates because it's quick, it's clean, and it gives you that factory finish hole. So, so, this, so this is that cut piece of rail once again. So, so the other thing that you can do is if you are working on, uh, after you have made the hole larger to accommodate for the, for the slope of that rail, you can also scribe from the, you know, the bottom of the rail hole on the one side to the bottom of the rail hole on the other. And that same angle that you've cut your rail out is going to be the angle of slope that that rail is going to sit at in uh, comparison to the ground. And so you can just set that cut rail uh, piece and scribe up, and that's where the bottom of the hole on the other side of the post is going to be. Uh, then you put your template on and you make your route. And that's what you're going to be finished with is that nice, steady, in one side, out the other. Now, if you use a line post or if you modify those posts uh, any way other than uh, – the rail holes, I'm sorry, the rail holes on the post anyway, other than toward the center, 
you may get something that looks a little like this first picture. And that's, that's what happens when you sell a line post at a steep grade instead of selling an M post and modifying it appropriately. Um, and if you, you know, if when you're quoting these, your sales guys aren't quoting the right parts, then your, your install crews are either going to have to make it work, which is the first picture, or you're going to have to pull off the job and you're going to have to order new parts, which is costing, costing us money, right? Uh, the last thing that you're going to do is you're going to get your picket. Uh, if, you're, if you're working by yourself, you use a clamp to set this up with two people. One can hold, the other can scribe your lines, and you're going to add an inch and a quarter and kind of dog ear those. You're also, again, because remember, anytime you're racking a panel, you're shrinking it, you're going to have to cut that end post, or I mean that uh, end channel uh, to, to match, and to match the hole because you've shrunk that hole up on the bottom and down on the top so that that channel is going to get smaller. Always, always remember to screw those end channels in. If you don't, you're going to have issues. It's very, very important to screw those end channels in, whether you're racking or on flat ground. And then after you've dog-eared your pieces, that's what that's kind of the look you're going to get on this our artificial uh, uh, slope, right? And then you put in your lock ring, put in your top rail, and you've got your finished uh, assembled panel. So. Hopefully, I, I, we want to keep we want to keep this brief. We know you're busy, even in the midst of, of everything. Uh, I know everyone's still booked out, and you're probably still out. Most of you uh, doing these installs. Uh, so, so we want to we want to respect your time. We're going to move to questions right quick here. But I want to give you an invitation. If if you found any of this interesting, or if you think you, your team, your sales guys, your install guys um, would benefit, reach out to your to your uh, territory manager, your sales guy, uh, he'll get you set up with an advanced training program. Um, this this ATP is designed for your sales guys and your install teams, as you can see. We want to bring them on the same page. Uh, for the sales guys, obviously, quoting things correctly is huge, um, both for their their confidence, for customer confidence, and, and for uh, the bottom line, so that your selling and, and getting the right parts out to the job and the right quantities. Um, for, your, for your install guys, um, I like to make sure they understand the, the products that they're putting in, the quality of the products. We, we go over a lot of um, product information uh, as well in this ATP. And, and I personally think that we're, you know, we're craftsmen here in the fence industry. We're doing a craft. And, and I want to inspire pride and confidence in that. So when you're passing a job, you want to point out to your, you know, your friends, your kids, hey, look, that's a fence. I, I put that in. Um, and, and putting in quality products, I think, is a part of that, uh, inspiring you to want to, to do a quality install. Um, and then also with completing the ATP, uh, you'll get employee IDs and, and certifications um, showing that, that your company is invested in, in quality products. Some companies hang these up in their offices. Uh, some employees just keep them. However you want to use that to the, to the benefit of your company. Um, the ATP and its completion, uh, for example, the extruded ATP, uh, these are all of the learning objectives. And then with the molded ATP, similarly, uh, we have all of these obje uh, uh, objectives. Um, we, we here at Certainty care about the industry. We care about the professional. Um, we want to make sure that you have tools to make your employees better. I know it's always hard to find uh, employees right now. That's the biggest complaint I hear. And so when you find new employees, good employees, we want to partner with you and help you in training them to <laughs> – we hear a lot about flattening the curve with this COVID-19 thing going on, right? Well, we want to flatten the, the, the learning curve for your employees so that they can get out and get productive as soon as possible and feel confident in the craft that they've chosen to undertake when they step into the fence world. So uh, if there's any questions, please shoot those in. Um, and while I'm waiting for the, for the test, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your dedication to the industry. Uh, we appreciate it. And let us know how we can help you and let us know how we can help your employees um, as you strive to, to be better every day. So. Okay, Glenn, one question that we had that's kind of off topic from what you covered today, but it comes up a lot. It's the imperial fence style 
And when you get into that style and start having odd post spacings and the best way to make that work, because that one's difficult because you have such a small space in between your mm. routes for the pickets. Yeah, that, that is, that is difficult. And there's a, there's a couple of things to that. One, one of the things is trying to manipulate your post spacing. So as you're going full, full sections, full sections, you want to kind of stop and take a pause when maybe you're six or seven, um, back and, and figure out from there how you want to, uh, shrink those sections. And, and allow your post spacing to be as beneficial to you as possible uh, when it comes to the, the picket spacing. Uh, the other thing is similar to what we saw with the breezewood, you want to find your center point of the rail. It isn't about measuring from one side and cut off, cutting off on the other. It's about finding a center point. With, with the imperial, as opposed to the breezewood, with the imperial, your center point, uh, depending on how that falls, may be dead center of a picket, or it may be dead center in between two pickets. And so finding whichever center point is going to give you the best uh, spacing between those posts, so playing, playing with those on the first section and, and breaking it up into evenly spaced sections uh, is going to be a real advantage. It's, it's kind of a, you know, save, save, a, save a pound by spending a penny in terms of time uh, by going, in the, go, going back and setting up those sections uh, and then determining where those pickets will fall in regard to the post and adjusting. So if you pick a, mid, a midpoint of the dead center of a picket, and when you get to the edge of the rail, um, you know, and then splitting that in half, and then you get to the to the edge of the rail where that measurement will be, and and your measurement is off. And when I say your measurement is off, consider that your rail is going should be inserting about two inches into that post, and so figuring out where that two inches is going to fall in regards to your pickets, so that you don't have a big gap uh, where a picket potentially could be going, uh, and just minimizing that from an, from an aesthetics perspective, uh, and then making your cuts and measuring and digging your post holes accordingly. Does that, does that make sense? If anyone doesn't understand, I know it's, it's harder when there's nothing but a voice talking to you. Um, it's easier when you're looking at a rail, but um, if there's any questions on that, sh shoot them in and have Doug uh, address specifically anything that I wasn't clear on. Yeah, and Glenn, like I said, with the Imperial, you definitely have to put a lot more thought and planning into it because you don't have a lot of forgiveness because you have such a small space in between your pickets. That's and you don't want to get into a situation where you're having a partial picket showing and you're trying to rip down a picket. So doing a little extra time laying it out and planning it and sometimes coming back a few sections instead of just trying to do it all in one section will benefit you there. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and with that, Doug, on that, on that same note, uh, I want to mention gates because with the Imperial gates, uh, this is another situation where you may want to consider just setting your gate size and maintaining it and saying, hey, we're going to do a pre-ordered gate size and that's what the gate opening is going to be because when you get into the world of trying to modify or custom build an imperial gate, you're dealing with that same challenge of, of picket spacing. And so if you're going to build that gate spacing, make sure that you do the gate work before you decide on that, on that uh, gate opening or determine at the beginning of the job, hey, we're only going to do a pre-built gate and that's the opening that we're going to make. Uh, so those things are going to save you a little heartache and a little time. And with gates, it, in some ways, it becomes even more essential because if you, you know, if your guys in the field get your measurements wrong, cut your gate wrong, and mess up a gate, uh, that's a, that's a that's a much more expensive issue than just needing to move a post, a post, or you know, modify a section.
Okay, and one thing that I will mention is that this presentation has been recorded and we'll post this on WebSource. So if you have other people at your company that you want to share it with, it'll be available for you. Hopefully it will be posted sometime on Monday once we get the recording and get it set up on the site and everything. But we do save these, so if you missed it today or if someone at your company missed it today, it will be available so you can view it on your own if you want to get your all your leads together so they can go over this. They can do it. There's past web eds that we've done. There's one that goes into a lot more detail on the breezewood, on racking. So there's a bunch of resources there on web source that you'll find under. We have a tab on there that's called web ed, so all the past recordings are there for you. Awesome. All right. And if there if if there's no more questions, this uh, scheduled a little more time for questions, I guess than than uh, we needed. So I don't know if that I, that means I did a good job explaining, or I've just put everyone to sleep at this point. Uh, but either way, uh, thanks again for for showing up to to be a part of this. Yeah, and if any of you think of questions that after we hang up and you, oh, I should have asked this question, feel free to reach out to your customer service rep or your territory manager, and they can get it to Glenn or I, and we can get you an answer on it. And once again, thanks everybody for attending today. Hopefully we'll get through this virus and life will get back to normal and we can get going full steam with getting the fence put into the ground. But thanks again for attending.